Good morning. Um, Philip and Katja have set the scene well. Um, I'll just add a little. Uh, yes, workplace pension schemes 20 years ago were a hallmark of the uh, British retirement. We were very proud, very smug about our retirement provision. Uh, but for various reasons, not our agenda today, they have reduced. Lord Turner eventually was asked to run the Pensions Commission and he reported uh, in uh, about 2005, I think it was, and the NEST auto-enrolment came out of his recommendations and in particular following the Pensions Act uh, 2008. Now, I'm going to do a bit of the technical stuff uh, as quickly as possible, but with comments uh, amongst them, uh, before I pass over to Francois for uh, uh, more of the comment. Um, and I'm starting with an advertisement. I don't think I realized that the pensions regulator was going to be here today, uh, but I was just going to draw your attention to the fact that his office do have a good reputation for producing easy to read, clear guidance on pension schemes and there are nine guides on this subject. Uh, I don't think the regulator has them with him but they're very easily downloadable from the website are uh, actually a good place to start for anyone who wants the details. But let me go straight into some of those details. Um, we've got a lot of new jargon to learn and I have to explain that. I don't want to be condescending uh, that means speaking down to the audience. Damn it, I've done it. Uh, but staging date is when it starts for you. Now, there is the brief guide. It's dictated by the number of people on your PAYE uh, base. And if you have more than one in your company, it's according to the biggest. And uh, you don't need uh, to remember or work out exactly when it is because the regulator is going to be helpful. He'll be writing to you 12 months, all employers 12 months before their, uh, uh, the relevant date for them, and again, uh, three months before the date. But actually, it would be smart for you to know now, there's quite a bit of work to do, exactly when it's going to apply for you. You can actually, if you wish, jump the gun. I think I've heard of one or two employers who say, well, let's get on with it, and they might well do that. Um, so uh, that is an option if you so wish. So the staging date, that's when it all starts for your company. Now, the qualifying criteria uh, must allow the employer to en automatically enroll, opt-in, and re-enroll a job holder. It's auto-enrollment. We, um, we think this is a good idea. It hasn't been tested. Although, until the mid-80s, companies were allowed to oblige their employees to join pension schemes, uh, but that was taken away. It was seen to be um, uh, a restriction of freedom of choice. But actually, when it comes to pension benefits and saving for retirement, the truth is that most people do need a discipline imposing on them. So auto-enrollment is not a new idea, but we, we think it is a good idea, and it's the best way to make sure that as many people as possible have pension provision. I'm so old, I can remember the good old days when we did have healthy, open, large British pension schemes. But even at their best, they only ever reached half the employed workforce. And this is a big step to, towards doing rather better than that. Now, the scheme in question that will be used for auto-enrolment must be a tax-registered occupational scheme or a personal pension scheme. Some non-UK pension schemes can be qualifying. It's a little complicated, and I won't go into that uh, detail now. Uh, more jargon. Uh, and names which at first sight are confusing. Uh, we have eligible job holders, we have non-eligible job holders, and we have entitled workers. Eligible, uh, eligible job holders are the main category. Those are those earning more than £7,475 a year. 
Uh, these are 2012 figures. They must be in the age range 22 to state pension age. And yes, if they pass those two tests, they're entitled for auto enrollment, they're entitled for company contributions, and yes, they may, if they wish, opt out. There's two categories of non-eligible job holders. Those who are earning less than 7,475, and in the age range 16 to 75, uh, they're not eligible for auto-enrollment, but they would be eligible for company contributions if they choose to opt in. And the other way in is designed for those who are earning more than 7,475, but they're between, aged between 16 and 22. So again, they would be eligible for company contributions if they choose to opt in. Now, the most confusing title is the entitled worker, uh, which means that, uh, no, they're not eligible for auto-enrollment, and no, they're not eligible for company contributions. Uh, they may join, uh, but entitled, uh, uh, entitled worker is a bit of a misnomer, but uh, you need to get used to the uh, terms. Now, some of you already have workplace pension schemes, and they may well, in fact, if you already have a scheme, it's more than likely that it would be good enough to pass muster for the new requirements. If you have a DB scheme, defined benefit scheme, then if it is contracted out of the state second pension, then it is by definition good enough. It's good enough as a vehicle to provide auto-enrollment for those uh, people who are eligible. If it's not contracted out, it's going to be okay if the level of benefit is at least one twentieth of uh, salary. Uh, that's about half the usual best rate of sixtieth, uh, payable from state pension age. Now, if you have a, a career average scheme, a care scheme as it's known, then it is necessary to ensure that uh, there's annual revaluation of benefits, both in service and in retirement. And as I said before, your existing scheme does have to be a UK tax-registered scheme, company scheme, or personal pension scheme. So, yes, most existing schemes will qualify. Now, Minimum requirements for DC, defined contribution schemes, are, uh, they're not terribly complicated, but a little different. Obviously, being DC, whether they're good enough is all about, is the contribution rate uh, sufficient? And the contribution rates must apply to earnings in the range 5,035 to 33,540. Now, those are already out of date. Those are 2007 figures and will be updated. We'll know the actual ones uh, early next year. But uh, from October 12, uh, when this brave new world of auto-enrollment auto kicks off, then there must be a 2% total contribution of which at least 1% must be employer because the total is being phased in. From October 16, it must be a 5% total, including a 2% employer contribution, and 8% uh, from October 17, including a 3% minimum employer contribution. So DC, it's very easy. It's all about making sure that your contribution rates are sufficient. Uh, more about salaries here, because it's quite possible that you may have or choose to have DC schemes which are not actually covering total earnings. They might be restricted to base pay, category one in that uh, picture, or they might be based on some pensionable pay figure uh, which would need to be at least 85% of total pay, or it could be total pay. Now that looks complicated, but the gist is that if you are choosing for your own practical convenience to base your auto-enrolled DC scheme on, say, basic pay, you may do, but you're going to have to pay a higher contribution rate. For example, the total contribution rate in that staging period jumps up from 2% to 3%. 
and at the end of the day jumps up from 7% to 9%, uh, and the similar effect on the employer contribution. So there is flexibility to choose how you are going to decide what will be pensionable pay in your auto-enrolled scheme. Now, hybrid plans, uh, that is, those pension plans that sit in that large space between DB and DC. Uh, you referred to the improvements reform of state pension benefits, and I'd be happy to congratulate the minister when he arrives later today on the good work he's doing there. And if I do have a quibble, uh, and he knows it, it's that uh, here we are, employers facing auto-enrolment, and the government, the last two governments and the coalition government, have not yet responded to the pleas to open up this middle ground to imaginative pension schemes sitting between DB and DC. Actually, the minister in recent weeks has said that he is now going to turn his attention to opening up this middle ground to make it easier to have pension schemes which are rather better than DC, covering some of the risks that Philip talked about, but actually not exposing employers to all the risks that are inherent in a DB scheme. So I encourage the minister to do that quickly, um, but uh, we are leaving it rather late to see what type of hybrid risk-sharing scheme might be allowed. Now, NEST, you will have heard of, I think, the National Employment Savings Trust, is set up, being set up, and that is aimed at low earners and those, I say, micro-employers who would probably be unwilling, unable, or find it impractical to set up their own pension plan. So, if you haven't got your own qualifying plan and you reach your staging date, then NEST is where you will end up. It is a DC pension plan and subject to the risk that Philip outlined. And uh, there is a cap on contributions. The government seems to be, I think their story is to try and help not take away too much business from the private sector. Uh, so they've set a contribution limit, an annual contribution limit of £4,200 on how much can go into NEST. And for the same reason, uh, they are not, they're saying they're not going to allow people to tr bring into NEST previous pension benefits or indeed transfer them out, although they are going to review that restriction in 2017. So employers may well use NEST. You don't have to be a small, any employer can use it. And indeed, you may use it for just some of your workforce. I should have said that you're not restricted to one scheme. You can use more than one qualifying scheme to meet your obligations under auto-enrollment. Um, so some companies may use them for uh, people with, they perceive, high turnover or low-paid groups. Uh, we shall see. Now, Nest Investments, it's going to be pretty big, uh, we think. Uh, Nest Investments uh, is a bit tricky because they are alert, Philip, to this problem of Fred on the shop floor finding out at the end of the year that 4,000 has gone in and he's only got 3,000 left just because of the volatility in the markets. So the blue approach on that chart um, uh, indicates that Nest intend to start their people off with low-risk investments and only later on start branching out into the higher reward but ultimately riskier investments. Now, that actually is the opposite of what would normally be seen as uh, conventional for a DC scheme. You'd normally say you can put your savings into these volatile but hopefully higher rewarding investments in the first part of your career and you ought to, ought to start going conservative as you approach retirement. But we shall have to see. I mean, Nest... Uh, there's no safety net. Isn't it strange uh, that we have a pension protection fund for divine benefit schemes, but there's no protection or support for DC schemes? Notwithstanding that in these last 10 years, more people have lost more pension expectation in DC schemes 
than has ever been lost in DB. As a direct consequence of these volatile markets, low interest rates, and uh, increasing longevity. And you know, I worry about a sense of complacency, people thinking, I'm in Nest, I'm in a pension scheme, I'm sorted, I don't have to worry. And even when Fred approaches retirement and is told he's got 30,000 quid, an amount of money that he's never actually had in one go before, he might feel quite smug. But he'd be very wrong, because that's when uh, the penny drops and he finds out that 30,000 quid at retirement should, with a bit of luck, be able to provide him a pension of £20 a week. That's not really uh, a very good base uh, for retirement. Taking benefits from Nest is very similar to a UK scheme. Uh, you can dip in from age 55 and you can have a quarter of it as a tax-free lump sum. Very tiny amounts can be commuted, uh, but we're still waiting for more information on other retirement options. They are aiming for uh, a, a highly electronic administration of the scheme, which makes sense, and they're also expecting people to switch on retirement benefits without advice. And I can understand the practical reasons for that, but actually it's the Freds with the £30,000 uh, who, who actually need a lot of advice. Okay, very quickly, when to automatically enrol... Uh, the first date a worker becomes an eligible job holder, but there is this, uh, Katya referred to this, there is this three months window. Uh, we've got to give information to the eligible job holder, um, but there is a, a three months gap if it suits us. And if we're using, say, a closed DB scheme that we already have for automatic enrolment, uh, then we can postpone using it for that purpose up to October 2016. Uh, details uh, apply, uh, but uh, more of those on another occasion. But as you understand, I think, uh, although we ought to enrol our people, uh, eligible job holders, into schemes, uh, we don't have to keep them there. They can opt out. Uh, they have to give an opt-out notice and uh, all the relevant information. Entitled workers, remember those are the people who are not entitled, Entitled workers have no opt-out rights, but they will have a 30-day cancellation period. Um, it's not possible to opt-out after the opt-out period has ended, but job holders can always cease act uh, active membership. Now, the opt-out period, uh, as I said, there's a joining window of a month, and then there's uh, an opt-out window of another month. So there's a bit of scope there for planning how you are going to deal with the opting in, opting out process. Now, you need to bear in mind that these notices about the nuts and bolts of opting in and out uh, must be provided normally by the pension scheme, not the employer. Okay, well, if the employer runs a dedicated pensions administration team, it obviously makes sense that they're involved, and that's okay. But it is the pension scheme's uh, obligation responsibility and uh, any opt-out notice given by a member must be checked by the employer he must stop deducting contributions let the scheme know and issue any refunds and there are various uh, uh, time limits for refunds the employer will have to watch that because if the pension scheme is going to be slow at making refunds then uh, the pension fund will have to uh, the employer will have to step in Finally, just a few tax issues. There might be a few lucky people out there, well, there are quite a few actually, who are caught by fixed protection under the tax rules, the tax simplification rules from 2006. Take care with any such people in your companies because if they're inadvertently enrolled into a pension scheme, they will lose their automatic tax uh, uh, protection under that act. Uh, salary sacrifice, we're still waiting further details from the department as to how those will work in practice. Okay, so time to start preparing. There is a lot of work to do. One, find out when your staging date is. Two, just work out how many people are going to be um, involved in auto-enrolment, which pension schemes you're going to use, and it might be NEST. You might have to tweak your scheme. Check all the internal procedures 
and finally be ready to issue all the necessary communication. Thank you.